Hi there. I've been wanting to make a series for a while where I document uh, some of my favorite stories of things that have happened to me. I think this is going to be that series, but it, it feels appropriate to start with the last couple of years. Uh, two years ago, um, I was living in LA and uh, I got this call from my dad that he was not um, well, he wasn't able to work. I was trying to figure out how to help my dad and um, I was doing stand-up comedy in Los Angeles and I was going to these pay-to-play mics, which is where you pay for the stage time. So when my dad was like, I don't know what to do about money and stuff, I was like, this is the only thing I've observed so far in my adult life that I feel like I could pull off. Eventually, it should be put into the hands of the comics themselves, uh, who should keep most of the money. And you know, as the original investor, you can keep a piece of it. I came to my hometown, Austin, Texas, and. I tried to start a pay-to-play mic, and the town lost its fucking mind. The people who had a problem with the concept didn't know I was from Austin. To them, I was some LA, California guy trying to come into Austin, Texas, as they always do, uh, to rip off the hard-working, weird local people. The thing I want to talk about is, I don't even know how to describe it, but the, the, the bullying, the, the harassment um, that we got. When we were just trying to do something uh, that we thought was good and right and fair, uh, we got attacked brutally online. Uh, mostly Facebook was the place where it happened, but it happened on every platform. They talked about us on the local radio, not favorably. It became a, 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 local, a local comedy news story in like January 2020. So um, they came at us hard, really hard. Welcome back. Episode two of uh, What the Fuck Happened to Rob Morris. This is going to be the part two of the hometown pariah story. Uh, as you can see, the weather has changed. It's been a full year and a half since part one. <laughs> You're like, is this, was this ever going to happen? Was he going to do another one? It's like three weeks ago. I am doing another one, doing a lot of them. Uh, got some transitional stuff going on in my world right now, so it's hard to get it out, but that's gonna be, that's gonna be different soon. So since I had a little bit of time to reflect, party, is he coming for me? Shit, oh shit. So I feel as though I should address something since I've had some time to get a little distance from this first part that I put out and talk to some people about it. I have a guest on the show today, Mr. Anthony Bain. We're going to talk about some of what happened. But I want to address, like, why, why are you telling this story? Like, what's the point? Who cares? Is it one of those, like, they were mean to me and I want everyone to know they were mean? No. It's not that. It's a little bit that, but it's mostly not that. Most of it's not that. That's not the point. So what is the point? The point is everything was on a different trajectory for me and I encountered something that I've never encountered before. I mean, I've had people disagree with me, but I've never been canceled. It feels weird to use that term because it was on such a small scale city-wide and uh you know i'd never been trolled on social media like that before i just never you know and i really was in a place where i was thinking like man i could take it if something like that happened and in like a way i did but here i am like almost two years later and i still think about it and i'm not like sad or bummed out i'm really not it's just it affected me in kind of a long-term way like it it was a knock to the head I've had one of those this year, so I know what I'm talking about. Anyway, let's get into the episode. The reason that I wanted to make this was so everybody knows what happened. So here's what happened, part two. Uh, 
Um, and it was ill timing for me because I had gotten really into uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V, in 2019. Uh, I just stumbled upon his stuff. I had started reading his books and his audio books and stuff like that. And I was getting really into this idea of like self entrepreneurship. It's kind of what gave me enough motivation to start the Romo Room. It was called something else uh, when we first started. But it, you know, I was I was getting a lot of that from Gary V. Like when I drove from L.A. to Austin, uh, back here to like start the room. I listened to like a whole Gary Vee audiobook the whole way there. No one who has played it safe ever made it big. This is your life, and I promise you, the chances of truly ruining it are slim. But he's a, you know, an entrepreneur. He's uh, someone who speaks very boldly about believe in yourself and go and create your own stuff and fuck what everybody says and shirk the judgment and create, 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 just keep making stuff. And as someone who grew up being an artist in a community theater and then into a conservatory and all this kind of stuff, the anyone who tells me that creation is the solution, I'm listening. So I was starting the process, and I wasn't diligent enough, but I was starting the process of documenting everything that happened um, with the business, uh, with the Romo Room. Uh, it was called The Daily at the time. So I was shooting video of the phone calls with my dad. I, I have video of me signing the lease on the original location, uh, you know, of me in L.A. planning to come out here. Uh, didn't get enough of the journey as I should have. But then I started, you know, um, making infographics and all this kind of stuff when I first got to town, trying to build this brand up because I wanted to start from the ground floor of this new thing, creating content, following the Gary Vee model. I mean, like, we need to pump out stuff and let people know who we are and be honest and be really direct and just be like, look, we're here to like try to help and make things better. And this is a really cool idea and, and, and just be super positive and upbeat about it. What's up, everybody? What's up, Instagram? This is it. This is the space. In the studio right now, I'm in the theater that we are opening for the daily open mic slash podcast studio. It's interesting because when I was a kid, I had this experience. I moved a lot and I went to different schools. And when I went to different schools, uh, I had watched enough movies where I should have known better, but I I had no other real approach for a long time other than to be like, hi everybody, like just the bit like just goofy from fucking goofy movie, like hello, like I I thought that was the best way to enter a new environment was just to be big and nice and fun and hello, I'd like to be everybody's friend, be outgoing, and I would constantly go to a new school or a new environment, and I would do that. And everyone would look at me like, who's this fucking like, ooh, ooh, ooh. like, oh my God, like what a loser. Like this guy doesn't know how to be cool, man. Be cool. I remember I went to a new school once. This was like my third elementary school. I'll never forget this. I think this kid's name was Tyler. I made a joke and uh, I laughed at the joke and a couple other people did too, but it didn't like kill. It was like a, a just a joke and I, you know, it didn't, it did okay, but I laughed at it with everybody. He was like, yeah, but a joke, <laughs> yeah, okay, we're all laughing. And this guy, Tyler, looks at me dead in the eyes and goes, it's not funny when you laugh at your own jokes. And like left, like walked away from me, said that, delivered it like a fucking knife and was like, just cool guy his way away from me. And I I, I, have, I can still remember the guy's fucking split down bowl, like fucking almost Dwight haircut, which was cooler at the time than it is now. Anyway, I know better. I know better than to walk into a room like, hey, everybody. Um, it's not cool. It's not embraced. Um, but it is authentic. It is who I am. And it's how I feel comfortable talking to people and, and engaging with people because it's honest. Uh, it's a, I've had it beaten out of me a number of times across my childhood. Don't be this honest version of yourself, you know? Don't, um, don't be the authentic you. Find the cool version. Drape yourself in coolness and find a way to be what they need you to be so that you can get in. And I did that for a long time. Uh... 
a long, long time. I, I let them tell me who I was supposed to be. And I, and I would lie all the time. I would go from school to school or town to town, or even in college, lie about my heritage, lie about things that today are even less okay and acceptable than they were then. They weren't then. But I was a person of identity crisis. Every time I tried to go somewhere new, and I did a lot, and be myself, as I was told in every movie and TV show and family member would tell me the same thing. Be yourself, be yourself, be yourself. And I would go and I would be myself and everyone would be like, you're a fucking loser and we don't like you and you can't sit with us. And that gets to you after the fifth or sixth school. And so you start going, fine, whatever. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be myself. They hate me. Like, why would I, why would I set myself up for that? It's hard enough to be new and to be a kid. I'm going to double down on authenticity. This is not helping my life at all. And so I learned this for a long time. This is how this is going to go. I really, really should have known better than to walk into the Austin comedy community, a town I grew up in that I know how they are. It's, it's not different. I should have fucking known better. And they dragged the shit out of me. Not only was it like, look at this loser who's like, hey, what's up, everybody? Like, not only is he a fucking idiot, authentic. Oh, my God. He's like trying to be real with us, which can't be real. That's the other thing I think that always turned people off. They were so sure that my authenticity, the real version of me, was fake. Because to them... It was inconceivable that someone could be that happy or that someone could be that friendly. All right. So what's up? <laughs> Please. Nothing. All right, good man. <laughs> That's good. Um, so let's. Uh, do you want to talk about when they were mean to us? Let's do it. Yeah. So, where do we begin? Uh, um, it kind of. Uh, it's kind of weird to me because I always thought as it was happening, uh, because at that point, if memory serves, we only had. Uh, kind of a Facebook page that put what we were and what our intentions were. You know, we put the rules on what we intended to charge and that we intended to exist in the near future. So we hadn't really existed at all. And instead of like uh, the normal thing where normally if you don't like a place, you just don't go, people came out of the woodwork to just totally uh, call us the Antichrist for whatever reason. Um, and I'm not really sure why it went to that point because um, we hadn't even had the opportunity to fuck up. <laughs> like we, <laughs> it was just uh, conceptually, we were the devil. You know, that was a point where um, I was pretty starved to be creative and I was trying to figure out ways to do that if memory serves, uh, was going to have my, my second kid on the way. And I was just trying to, uh, figure out what that next step was creatively, because it's something that was a void in, in my life at that point. And when you came to me with that, it seemed like something that was really appealing because in the scene as it was back then, it didn't seem accessible for somebody that wanted to learn. Um, or be part of it. Um, it was almost one of those things where you knew that you there was a way, but you didn't know how to get in. And it, it became very clear whenever this concept was uh, suggested who those gatekeepers were at the time, because they seemed immediately threatened by it or disgusted by it. Because you do mics and stuff, which I had, but then you don't know really where to go after that. Um, if you don't necessarily 
know the right people or you're not in the same circles, I would like to dedicate more time and learn how to expand my craft. Um, but it seemed really difficult at that time. But it's just like anything else. You just have to educate yourself and learn about it. But um, when you came to me with the the idea that you had, you've always been a good a good teacher when you directed me when we're in plays and other things. Where I was like, if nothing else, this is a good a good way to to learn. And ultimately, I thought it would be something fun and something new. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. I know that we kind of had a meeting at a Chewy's with a group of us uh, just to talk about the concept and um, how we would go about it from there. It was a, uh, it was completely planned and we didn't even have the opportunity to even try that plan in the way we intended. Do you think that that's part of what hurt it? Like, because it felt so contrived before anyone knew that it was happening and that it didn't like, you know, cause you think about the scene that we're in now and a lot of stuff that pops up is interesting and it may happen once, but the idea of an entire establishment, just like we're going to open and be a comedy thing even now would be like, Oh, okay. That would kind of surprise you, especially if it was being opened by people you'd never heard of. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? If like, if Mike Hudak was like opening, he's like, I'm going to open a comedy club or I'm going to open a venue or I'm going to have a pay to play mic or even anything like that. You'd be like, Oh, what's Mike up to? But if literally it was two people that you, or three or four or five, whatever that are like, you've never heard of mm -hmm. that would have an effect on it. Especially if it seems to be such a package, like it's ready. We did it. We're not asking for your opinion. It's, this is what we're going to do. Right. And and I totally get that perspective now that we're on the other side, <laughs> but um, I wouldn't immediately go to think that it was uh, something that was trying to take advantage of people. But I think that uh, the, the unique thing is, is that it was just a concept, yet it made it all the way to the local radio with an opinion when there hadn't even been a door open. There is a guy. There's a guy. Or maybe it's more than one guy. I don't know. Now, maybe we should say these people don't understand how performance works. Apparently, this yeah. guy was living in L.A. or something and moved here and is... Uh, oh, God, Matt, why are you going down this is road? This gonna us, is this going to cause us... Or is this going to cause another battle? Alone. No, but it made me angry. Um, because not only were people shooting down the concept, but as you know, more than anyone, because it was all essentially directed at you, they were very personal in the way that they went about uh, directing their feelings on everything. Is this going to cause a battle? I want it to cause a battle, maybe. I'll bring in all the stuff. I'm, I'm on. I'm on prepared because I would love to show you the website and everything because it's so well. As it, nipples the, the, good. The Facebook original post has been taken down, probably because so. the guy was a bit of an idiot. Um, and it became less about um, the actual business itself, and it was more about um, how they painted you as an individual. It became a whole different thing, and it, be and it crossed a whole different line, um, which I didn't think was fair um and the fact the, that nobody even spoke up the neutral people weren't even like oh, they're just kind of like well we're gonna see how this goes <laughs>